Question number 11 on the final exam comes from section A.2, previously tested on the first exam, number 1D. A uh, student will be able to completely factor polynomial expressions. Directions say factor the polynomial completely. Uh, whenever you see a four-term polynomial, the strategy that you're going to use is grouping. Uh, with the grouping strategy, we look for common factors in pairs of terms. So I'm going to look in these terms, and I'm going to look in these terms for common factors. In the first pair of terms, there is an x squared common, it leaves behind x plus 5. And in the next two terms, there's a negative 9 common, it leaves behind x plus 5. Uh, the x plus 5 is common, so we pull it out, x plus 5, and that leaves behind out of this term, it leaves behind x squared, out of this term it leaves behind minus 9, and then that x squared minus 9, we recognize as a difference of two squares, factors x plus 3, x minus 3. One more problem where, again, we're asked to factor the polynomial completely. Uh, it's another four-term polynomial, so it's probably pretty likely that that's going to happen on your test. Um, so again, I group pairs of terms, these two terms, with these two terms, and I'm looking for common factors out of each pair of terms. So I can take an x to the fifth out of the first two, leaving x squared plus 1. Out of the next two we take behind or take out a negative 4x leaving me with x squared plus 1. So let's see the x squared plus 1 is common leaving me with x to the fifth minus 4x. Now we notice in this binomial that there is common factor of x so I take it out and I just removed it all the way to the front it would leave behind x to the fourth minus 4 and we recognize that x to the fourth minus 4 as a difference of squares x plus 2 and x minus x squared sorry x squared plus 2 x squared minus 2. Question number 12 on the final exam comes out of section 7.4 which is the last one that we just did so of course this has not previously been tested. Students are going to have to be able to set up that's key just set up a partial fraction decomp decomposition not actually solve uh, for the constants but just set it up as uh, the actual solving of the whole problem might take too long uh, on the final exam so we just want to know how to set it up is all I'm going to test you on. Directions say identify the form of the partial fraction decomposition do not solve for the constants it says identify because on the exam it's going to be multiple choice so you're going to be presented with options you'll have to choose the correct one. Uh, what we have to do first is completely factor the denominator. If it already is factored then you don't have to do that step but you need to check for that and see do you need to factor that. Well in this case it is factored already so the form of the partial fraction decomposition you're going to have one fraction for every factor so one fraction for the x, one for the x plus 4, one for the repeated x plus 4 which will be x plus 4 squared since these are all linear they get just single numerical constants in their numerator that's it next problem we look at that denominator and recognize that it needs to be factored so that would be x squared minus 4 x squared plus 4 
which becomes x plus 2, x minus 2, x squared plus 4. Of course, that numerator is still over all this, but for the form of the decomposition, all that's important really is the denominator, and then setting up one fraction for each of those factors. So we'll have an x plus 2, we'll have an x minus 2, we'll have an x squared plus 4. The linear factors just get single constants, single numerical constants. The quadratic factor gets a linear factor, we'll use the letter C, x plus D. There is the form, again minus the actual solving for the constants. Question 13 on the final exam comes from section P.5, one of the early ones in the year. It has not been previously tested. Student will be able to solve radical equations. These equations may or may not involve extraneous solutions. So one of the examples we'll do will show that um, and what you'll see when you encounter an extraneous solution. Directions say solve the equation that involves a square root. The first thing to do is to get the square root all by itself. So I'm going to add 4 to both sides, resulting in square root x plus 5 equals 10. And now we're going to square off the square root. We're going to square both sides. The result is x plus 5 equals 100, and if we subtract the 5 from both sides, the problem will be finished. We'll have x equals 95. In this next problem, the first step is the same first step as uh, we previously saw. We have to get the radical all by itself. So we subtract 2 from both sides. The result is the square root x plus 10 equals x minus 2. And just like on the last problem, we're going to square off the square root, and we're going to square this side, but I'm going to add parentheses as I square this side. So on the, the left, we get x plus 10, but on the right, we get this binomial squared, and we must FOIL this out to get the correct product. So we get x squared minus 4x plus 4. So now we have a quadratic equation. And with the quadratic equation, I like them equal to 0. So I'm going to take the x and subtract it on over. Take the 10, subtract it. The result will be x squared minus 5x minus 6. I'm going to try and factor that. Factors x minus 6, x plus 1. So we get x equals 6, x equals negative 1. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and check these solutions. Oftentimes when you get quadratic equations, you should check the solutions. Uh, because these solutions are solutions to the quadratic, they may not be solutions to the original problem. So if I substitute in 6 and C, that's going to give square root 16 plus 2. That's going to give 4 plus 2, which is 6 equals 6. So that one works. We're going to keep it. Now, if I try, oh, I don't know, let's try over here, the negative 1. Negative 1 plus 10 plus 2 equals negative 1. So that's square root of 9 plus 2. It's negative 1. It's 3 plus 2 equals negative 1, which is 5 equals negative 1. 5 does not equal negative 1. 
and that solution does not work. So only six is the correct answer to this problem. Question 14 on the final exam comes from section 2.4, previously tested on exam three, number one. The student will be able to divide polynomials using synthetic division. All right, the first thing to do in this problem is to rewrite it, to set it up. So inside we've got 2x to the fourth, negative 1x cubed, 3x squared, 0x, and negative 9. Okay, very important that you look and don't forget the zeros. Okay, there's a missing term of x in this uh, problem. We need to have that missing term identified there as the zero. Now on the outside here we're going to use the zero of this factor so we don't use positive two, we use negative two. So we bring down and now we multiply, we add and we multiply, we add and we multiply, we add and we multiply and one more time we're going to add we get 43 as the remainder. Now we put all the x's back in, we decrease the power by 1, so this is 2x cubed minus 5x squared plus 13x minus 26 plus the remainder 43 divided by x plus 2. Alright, next one, again we set up the problem first. As we set it up, we look for any zeros, any missing terms. So be careful about that on the final. The two examples I'm showing you have had missing terms. So make sure you look for that and be ready for it. We're going to divide by negative 4. That's the zero of the factor or the divisor. So we bring down the first term and we multiply. We add together and we multiply. We add together. We multiply and we add to complete the synthetic division. Now we put our powers of x back in, drop by 1, x squared minus 4x plus 11. Because the remainder is negative, I'm going to write minus 42 divided by x plus 4. Question 15 comes from section 1.5. It has been previously tested on exam two, question number two, and it's gonna to test to see if you are able to find the inverse of a function that has an inverse. All right, the directions say find the inverse of the function f of x equals three x plus eight. The first step in finding an inverse is to rewrite it as y equals once you've written it as y equals, you're going to interchange the x's and y's. Okay. Once we're here, now the task becomes solve for the y. And the two easy steps are done. Now we've got this challenge of solving this equation for y. So to solve this equation for y, I'm going to subtract the x across. And I'm going to just use, switch sides here. I've got 3y now equals x minus 8. We're going to divide by 3, giving me y equals 1 third x minus 8 thirds. Okay, that is our inverse function. The last step is just a notation step. We shift back to function notation, indicating inverse with the negative 1 exponent f inverse of x equals one-third x minus eight-thirds. Next question, find the inverse of the function. We begin again by rewriting it as y equals, so two-thirds x minus four. We switch the x and y. So x equals 2 thirds y minus 4. And now we're going to start solving for y. So I begin by moving the 4 to the opposite side, giving me 
2 thirds y equals x plus 4. Uh, dealing with the fraction, I like to multiply by the reciprocal of the fraction. So that then gives me y equals 3 halves x plus 6, which we then rewrite g inverse equals 3 halves x plus 6. Last problem, h of x equals the cube root of x plus 8. We begin with y equals cube root of x plus 8. So we switch x and y. x equals cube root of y plus 8. We are going to take that and now solve for y. We move the 8 across. So that is cube root of y equals x minus 8. We get rid of the cube root by cubing both sides. And we end up with y equals x minus 8 cubed or h inverse of x equals x minus 8 cubed.